Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I wish I could have been with you in person and I miss visiting the Pacific Northwest. Yet this way of participation at least gives a small CO2 footprint. I'm speaking to you from Norway as a scientist, but also as a person with deep relation to salmon. I caught my first salmon at the age of 14 and it became decisive to my life and to my professional career. Uh, I take this opportunity to mix both my scientific um, approach to salmon, but also mix that with some of my personal views. What is a salmon? As a European, my salmon is Salmo Salar. Uh, Norway, the country with the biggest remaining stocks of wild Atlantic salmon, recorded 176,000 uh, wild salmon caught last year. This is also a salmon. It's a pink salmon, or Uncorincus corbucha. In the same year, in 2021, 184,000 pink salmon was caught in Norway, more than wild Atlantic salmon. I bring up this in the start here, uh, because I think this shows how novel challenges show up uh, briefly. Uh, and it is also partly a parallel to the, the uh, spread of Atlantic salmon in the Pacific, primarily for aquaculture purposes. My talk here today is for going to follow this, this outline. I'm giving a, a brief introduction of the differences between Atlantic salmon and the Pacific salmons uh, on ecology, on the threats and the management. Uh, I'm then going on to discuss the reasons uh, uh, that are behind the loss of values related to Atlantic salmon. Then I'll present a few successful European wild salmon restoration projects, and then go on to discuss the global large, largely unaddressed challenges of climate change, ocean pollution, aquaculture impacts, and non-native species. Uh, and. Uh, and give my opinion on why I think site and species specific research, conservation and restoration targeting wild salmon needs to be supplemented with global actions and international cooperation. Some of the key differences between uh, the Atlantic and the Pacific salmons are, uh, of course, their geographical regional distribution. The Pacific salmons are native to the Pacific Ocean uh, and the Atlantic to the Atlantic. Um, one big uh, important uh, life history difference is that the Atlantic salmon is so-called iteroparos. Uh, it's not semilparos as mo most Pacific salmon. Uh, the Atlantic salmon commonly spend one, two or three winters at sea uh, and grows to approximately four 10 or 22 pounds. We also have, uh, especially in the northern parts of the Atlantic salmon distribution range, uh, multiple spawners that uh, tend to be far bigger, often reaching 30 and 40 pounds. Another very important difference between the Pacific and Europe is that the right to fish in Europe is primarily privately held. Uh, Therefore, fisheries are subject both to private as well as public management. Also, uh, in the recent decades, uh, we have seen that the Atlantic salmon is no longer a resource uh, that can sustain significant commercial fisheries. Neither is sea ranching uh, common within Atlantic salmon. Uh, instead, since the 1980s, Atlantic salmon has established as a highly successful species for aquaculture, not only in Norway, not only in Europe, but now also to a growing extent along the Pacific coast. Um, <clears throat> this picture is taken from the southern interior of France. It's from the uh, River Allier. 
This is one of the most fascinating areas where salmon, Atlantic salmon live. Far from the, from the ocean, high in the southern inlands of France, we have a remaining stock of wild Atlantic salmon that struggle to, to survive. Um, it's very typical that we see that in Europe, uh, it's in the southern areas that salmon struggle the most. Well, I'll come back to that. This figure tells uh, a lot of the current status of wild Atlantic salmon. These grim figures uh, shows a dramatic decline in catches of salmon during the last 50 years. Um, <clears throat> we can see from these figures taken from the ISIS working group on Atlantic salmon that the catches uh, are reduced by 80 or actually 90 percent since the mid-1970s. Um, catches in the uh, 1960s and 70s were probably uh, not sustainable um, uh, and actually led to the establishment of NASCO, the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization, this intergovernmental uh, organization that is a parallel to the Pacific um, Salmon Commission. Um, <clears throat> another uh, very obvious um, uh, message from these figures is that it's primarily in Northern Europe uh, that we have a remaining uh, viable fishery for Atlantic salmon. For those of you uh, used to figures of our Pacific salmon catch, it's, it's also very important to note how small a resource wild Atlantic salmon are. So all the new threats affect wild Atlantic salmon as they do Pacific salmon. Wild salmon was affected by especially migration barriers and pollution following the industrialization in mainland Europe already from the early 1800s. Rivers like the Thames in London and the Rhine in Germany were big salmon rivers back in those days and they both lost their salmon stocks very early on. Uh, in more recent periods, the uh, the 1960s to 1992 focused a lot on ocean over harvest as well as impacts from hydropower development. Uh, in the more recent decades we have seen a range of new threats emerging with globalization, escalating climate change and the rapid growth of salmon aquaculture. Um, <clears throat> Overall, uh, ISIS and NASCO estimates that the current pre-fishery abundance is reduced by more than 50% since the mid-1980s. Uh, this figure here is taken from a formal Norwegian scientific advisory board. Um, they organize the, the threats and the loss factors in four categories. Uh, the most uh, severe are called population threats. The, the less severe ones are called loss factors. And then they characterize these two into those they consider stabilized uh, and those who are expanding. And as we can see from this figure, the two most severe population threats are both related to salmon aquaculture. Firstly, the loss of genetic diversity due to uh, escapees from salmon farms and the other increased mortality to, to uh, smolts due to salmon lice uh, produced in the aquaculture uh, facilities. Given this background on the status of the stocks, uh, what are the values to people of Atlantic salmon today? Well, uh, we have used salmon for commercial uh, purposes. That's no longer um, uh, something of any significance, but subsistence fisheries still are, and recreational fisheries definitely are. There are also a lot of non-fishing values related to Atlantic salmon. 
So depending on how we use or relate to salmon, it provides us people with different values or gifts or benefits. Uh, there are different terms here that I'm sure you know about, like ecosystem services and also nature's contribution to people. Um, let me just share with you some key values, uh, crude values of Atlantic salmon uh, of recent years. This is, a, this is a summary we made for NASCO um, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and we used uh, 2017 as the point of departure. Um, um, in 2017, uh, the total catch in subsistence fisheries was approximately 500 metric tons, or uh, a little under 200,000 salmon. Uh, and it was approximately 5,000 fishers uh, involved in these fisheries. Um, <clears throat> We also saw that the licensed subsistence units uh, had fallen from approximately 5,000 in year 2000 to uh, less than half to 2,000 in 2017. So uh, there are clear indications that subsistence fisheries are being smaller and smaller. Uh, when it comes to recreational fisheries or angling, um, Approximately 380,000 uh, salmon, uh, approximately twice the number of, um, of that of subsistence fisheries, uh, uh, was caught by around 300,000 anglers fishing more than 2 million days. Uh, and these figures include both catch and release and catch and kill fisheries. Um, and Unlike uh, the, the, the subsistence fisheries, the number of anglers involved in Atlantic salmon fisheries seem to be relatively stable, and the total ex uh, calculated expenditures related to recreational fisheries range between 300 and 500 million euro euros per year. Uh, of course, the salmon, the, the wild Atlantic salmon, is valuable for many other reasons than these crude numbers. Uh, the, the salmon in Europe is richly represented in folklore, in cultural expressions and practices among many people inhabiting the northern parts of the Atlantic Ocean. One example is the drawing here, which is, uh, which is from an old Welsh folk tale where the salmon of Lyn 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 carries knights of King Arthur up, up the Severn rivers, River in Wales. So, can restoration stop the decline of wild salmon? We see now uh, a number of um, initiatives uh, to restore or ma maintain, sustain salmon or salmon values in watersheds both along the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. Cultivations, uh, hatcheries, used to be the primary measure, but has become more and more controversial as new science has, has showed how this can be problematic from a biodiversity conservation perspective. Instead, we see growing focus on, for instance, dam removals. We have excellent examples in North America from the Penobscot in Maine, the Elva outside where you are now on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, also here in Europe, we follow the Snake River Dam debate. Uh, we have uh, other smaller and larger habitat restoration uh, and habitat improvement projects focusing both on rivers but also uh, riparian zones, for instance, through tree planting. And we have projects trying to remove or control uh, non-native species, also like the, 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 the pink salmon I mentioned in my, in my introduction. I'm now going to give um, a couple of examples on how, on how valuable uh, a few European projects has been, uh, one from Norway and one from Denmark, uh, before going on to discuss if these, uh, these uh, river-based or watershed-based restoration projects is enough. 
The first uh, example I'm going to give is um, related to the um, gyrodactylus salaris infection and subsequent restoration in Norway. This small fluke, uh, the gyrodactylus, was unintentionally brought to Norway from the Baltic in the late 1970s um, with, with, uh, with hatchery par. Uh, and uh, before, that was before its devastating effect was known. Uh, the fluke seems to live in harmony, uh, I quote that, uh, with Baltic Atlantic salmon, which is a subspecies, but is lethal to salmon migrating to the Atlantic. Uh, Norwegian authorities uh, have run an eradication program since discovery of the devastating effect of this parasite in the early 1980s. And uh, the primary treatment has been rotenone, uh, which is used to eradicate uh, not only the parasite, but also the host fish, meaning the wild salmon, uh, and also other salmonids, especially sea trout or anadromous brown trout. Um, <coughs> Uh, th these these uh, these efforts was largely unsuccessful until the the early 2000s, where uh, 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 a large reassessment of the strategy was done and uh, a better treatment program was was established with with uh, quite significant budgets in Norwegian terms, with annual spendings of more than uh, 10 million US dollars uh, every year. Um, since then also uh, new treatment measures have been uh, been investigated and discovered uh, uh, both aluminum salts and chlorine are now used which are not killing the host species uh, the river Lardal is one of Norway's most famous salmon rivers and it has been uh, very important for the the, the local community since the early 1800s, actually. Uh, this river was uh, infected with a parasite all, uh, quite late, uh, actually, in the mid-1990s. Uh, and uh, we saw an immediate drop in the, the salmon production from that river. Um, <clears throat> we, have, uh, we have looked at the, at the local economic impacts of salmon angling in this river uh, before, during, and after um, after the parasite, so to say, and um, and um, we have looked primarily at the the impacts of uh, fishing tourism, um, and we found that the the previous and future income loss if the parasite remains in the river is more than 12 million euros. The overall cost of the treatment of the river is is only 4.6 million euros. So this gives um, gives a very profitable uh, profitable um, margin to this restoration project um, because you get back uh, almost uh, or more than two and a half times what you actually spent. Uh, you can read more about that in this report uh, cited here. Um, another uh, interesting example is uh, is the river Skern in 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 West Denmark, south of Norway. Uh, uh, this is Denmark's most important salmon river. Uh, the, the the native stock there was thought to be be extinct, but um, luckily some native specimens were were discovered in the tributary and and taken to a gene bank. Uh, while waiting for this big restoration project. This river was channelized into a straight channel, actually over almost 20 kilometers uh, in the 1950s for agricultural purposes. Uh, after a long debate in Denmark uh, involving also EU, um, the European Union, um, they decided to restore both the me meandering river and the whole floodplain, and, um, and it is, uh, 
considered to be the largest biodiversity restoration project in Northern Europe. This was done in, um, everything was done over two years in uh, the early 2000s, and, uh, and uh, the 19 kilometer of channelized river was restored back into 26 kilometer of meandering river, so quite a lot of excavators working there. The total cost of this project was nearly 30, 40 million euros. Uh, however, the, 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 the benefits, the, the total value creation in this project is not yet accounted for in total. Um, there has been several studies showing how the angling tourism business has thrived after the restoration. Um, uh, but the impacts and the benefits goes across uh, several sectors, not only to salmon fishing. It goes on biodiversity, it goes on, uh, on reduced pollution, it goes on reduced um, sediment transportation out into the North Sea and so forth. Um, another interesting finding in some of the research um, surrounding the River Scan project is also that the profits to agriculture from the Channelization in the 1950s was much lower than expected. The salmon season in River Scan started just a few days ago, and uh, there was a fantastic fishing on the opening days. Among them, this picture taken from social media showing a 40 plus pound wild Atlantic salmon. These uh, successful single uh, restoration stories uh, and others in many countries do not stop the decline of wild salmon. Uh, the, the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation talk about a species in crisis. Uh, they use this as a headline for the year of the salmon uh, that was, uh, was uh, declared in 2019. Um, uh, overall, we, 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 this negative trend seemed to continue, uh, and it is uh, significantly worsened in the southern parts of the species range. And there seem to be a lot of similarities in the overall patterns, both for Pacific and Atlantic salmon. Uh, a number of general stre stressors uh, besides those acting in single rivers, in single watersheds, seem to affect all or at least most stocks. And those stressors are those hitting the coasts and oceans and that lead to reduced survival and or increased mortality. And some of those that we really need to discuss is climate change and pollution. Uh, we also have to address the, the, the huge impacts from aquaculture, from salmon farming primarily, uh, both the, the loss of genetic variation from escapees and the increased mortality from sea lice. Uh, we also have other diseases and parasites, uh, some novel, some interacting with environmental conditions in freshwater and so, so on. Uh, and then, in addition, uh, we have uh, issues that at, l at least uh, uh, practitioners like to focus on these days, like uh, predation, uh, overharvest of food fish, or, uh, or uh, continued mixed stock fishery impacts and even bycatch. How can we solve these general uh, problems, uh, these problems that seem to be acting mostly in the marine environment. Well, uh, I would like to finish this talk by, by urging for more or better international cooperation. Uh, we see a lot of science going on. Um, science is, is, is fine, but in my opinion, far from enough. Uh, <coughs> And I, I would like to be a bit uh, ironic or, 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 or critical and ask if it's likely that there are particular challenges that threaten salmon uh, and that are not related to some of these global uh, general challenges such as climate change and ocean pollution. In my uh, 
assessment loss, this loss or, or gradually strong reduction in salmon stocks is just one case in many in the dramatic ongoing mass extinction on the earth, unfortunately. Uh, I would like to continue also by being quite frank and, and direct uh, and, uh, and, uh, and suggest that, especially NASCO, that I know quite well from, from different uh, tasks there over the years, need to be revitalized. I don't know if that goes for the Pacific Salmon Commission as well, but uh, in my opinion, NASCO has lost, lost its relevance since the important role it played in the 1980s and the 1990s, where it actually halted and solved a, comp a really, really complex uh, problem related to uh, overharvesting in the oceans. Of course, this is not uh, a critique of, of those uh, participating in NOSCO or the Pacific Salmon Commission, for that matter, because these organizations can't do more than the than the, uh, than the member countries' uh, governments uh, allow them to do. Uh, yet, I would uh, like to throw across some ideas for how international cooperation could be strengthened. And uh, one of my ideas is how could NASCO and the Pacific Salmon Con Commission maybe cooperate better with other international organizations uh, like the ICAT, the the Bern Convention system, the Polar Bear Treaty, and other international treaties dealing with migratory species and or uh, fish resources that are subject to, to ocean, um, uh, ocean management. Um, I would also uh, throw forward uh, um, the need for NOSCO and the Pacific Salmon Commission to spearhead international initiatives and national, international uh, regulations targeting sustainable salmon aquaculture. Uh, True, for instance, uh, uh, agreements that, uh, that um, encourage closed containment, zero pollution, reduced mortality, sustainable food and value chains, uh, for instance. So by this, I would like to end my presentation uh, and, uh, and uh, just state that to me, there is no life without salmon. Uh, uh, I would thank you for listening to me this morning and uh, you will see uh, some of the sources. I built this uh, presentation on here on this last slide and also the photographers and the sources for the illustrations I've used. Thank you so much. We have a question from the audience here, and um, the, in the United States, particularly in the Pacific uh, Northwest, as well as the Great Lakes region, um, it is very common to work with the sovereign um, indigenous peoples in local areas in terms of both cultural and um, restoration practices, and I wanted to see, does anything like that play out, um, either in Norway or any of your work that you've seen related to the North Atlantic Sound? Uh, I struggle to hear the question actually, uh, first from the person who stated it and also from your yeah, repetition. Response. Wait, then go ahead. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't get the whole question. I struggled to hear, hear your, uh, you repeating it, uh, unfortunately. Um, Let me try again then. Um, so yes, please. I hear you better now. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so in the United States, um, and in parts of Canada, we have um, a practice of working, particularly in the Pacific um, Northwest and in the Great Lakes regions. Of working with sovereign indigenous 
um, tribes for both cultural and restoration practices related to salmon. And our participant here would like to know um, if you have similar types of collaborations um, in either Norway with local peoples or, um, or somewhere else in Europe with your work. Yes, thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. I, uh, as some of you might know, in Norway, we have um, Sami people, which are uh, indigenous people, in spe especially in the northern part of, uh, of Scandinavia and also in Northwest Russia. Uh, several of, um, of the Sami people are deeply involved in salmon um, and salmon fisheries. Uh, and um, and uh, generally, I would say that they are to a large degree involved in management and, and, and different projects. Uh, uh, they are not always free from conflict. Um, uh, and uh, especially, um, there is one very important salmon river in uh, which is bordering Norway and Finland uh, called the uh, Tana uh, or the Adnu in Sami. Um, this river has been subject to severe overharvest. Um, and uh, last year, uh, Norwegian and Finnish authorities that managed this river together, also in cooperation with local stakeholders, they uh, they decided to close the fishery. Um, of course, that was very, very dramatic and also caused a lot of uh, debate. And there is currently there a big debate about how can the cultural value of salmon and salmon fisheries for Sami people be conserved and maintained for the future? Is it most important to, to stop fishing for a period uh, or is it important to uphold some kind of fishing activity also to keep the culture, the practice uh, alive? Um, um, so yes, definitely. Also uh, elsewhere in Norway and Europe, uh, there, is, uh, there are uh, indigenous people in Greenland and Greenland has, uh, has uh, still a subsistence fishery which is regulated by NOSCO and also under surveillance from from both North American and European uh, stakeholder and NGOs and researchers and and authorities. Um, <clears throat> I unfortunately have very little knowledge about Greenland uh, subsistence salmon fishery. It mostly harvests North American uh, Atlantic salmon actually. Uh, elsewhere in Europe, because as I said, uh, there is uh, a private right to fish for salmon in most European countries and also partly in Eastern Canada, as far as I know. Uh, so the, the cooperation surrounding salmon management, salmon conservation, uh, the regulation of salmon fisheries is generally very strong here because there is this public-private mix uh, that is sort of the established way of doing things. Thank you. We have a question from the Zoom chat um, from Fred Fjords. To emphasize the international biodiversity role of Atlantic and Pacific salmon, do you think the role of the IUCN salmon specialist group should be strengthened or expanded? Does salmon politics hinder this idea? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question too. Um, uh, I don't know well enough the IUCN salmon specialist group actually, so I'd like to learn more about it. Uh, the international um, groups that uh, that I mostly have dealt with is the the NASCO, which is an intergovernmental organization. Uh, established to conserve salmon uh, primarily um, in the marine environment and, and manage um, ocean harvest, uh, which was a big issue and a, a severe challenge uh, for sustainable management from the 1960s until these ocean fisheries mostly was closed down in the early 1990s. Um, uh, I think, um, I think, um, I, I would welcome uh, all initiatives 
that uh, put pressure on especially NOSCO and the Pacific SAM Commission. Um, uh, I think it's uh, I, I think this is a very important role for all the NGOs involved in in salmon conservation to put more pressure on on these organizations and the member governments to to try to to overcome these these as you say here the the, the person writing this question um, to 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 try to overcome this issue of salmon politics uh, because I think at the moment uh, at least NASCO that I will know very well seem to be quite uh, tied up. Uh, and have little freedom to, for instance, address the the, the, the very, very well um, documented challenges related to salmon aquaculture, for instance, in Europe. We have another question from Zoom. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned the different view pra uh, practice of using hatcheries for helping the fish or fisheries in the US and Europe and Norway. Why this difference in practice and view on hatcheries? Well, I, I don't think there is a big difference in view. Uh, uh, I think the science that is the basis for uh, the sort of uh, the loss of credibility of the of the hatcheries um, for for wild fish or, or wild salmon uh, management uh, is the same for Pacific and Atlantic salmon, and there is a lot of exchange between the the experts working with Pacific salmon and Atlantic salmon. Um, <clears throat> uh, what I see is the, 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 the different views, they are not between the expert, but maybe between the expert and the politicians, uh, and maybe between the experts and, uh, and those involved in fisheries. Um, um, I wrote a paper together with several really, really good colleagues uh, a few years ago where we looked at the uh, hatchery policy uh, in uh, Canada, Norway, Sweden, and Germany and France uh, for salmonids in general. Uh, I mean, salmonids, both Pacific salmon, salmonids and European salmonids have been moved all around the world for almost two centuries now. Um, uh, so you have a lot of brown trout in North America, and we have a lot of rainbow trout in Europe, for instance. Um, uh, and the same has uh, has happened with the Pacific salmon being moved uh, to uh, to Europe or tried being moved to, to Europe. Um, uh, I mentioned this case with the pink salmon now suddenly exploding in Norway after having having been in the Barents region for almost 50 years uh, without making much out of it itself. Um, no one really knows why that happened, but but generally we have moved salmonids around the world for because they have been valuable. Um, and we have tried, we thought for a long time, for a long period, we thought it was good. And then suddenly we find out, find out it's not so good. And hatcheries as a part of this is the scientists, the genetic expert tells us this is not good. Uh, then we see that both in Europe and North America, um, uh, stocking is used as a measure to compensate, especially for hydropower. Um, this I think is still done to a large extent, both in the US and in, in Europe. Uh, however, I see that it's done quite differently. And in North America, there still seem to be this trend of stocking for what we call ocean ranching. Uh, <clears throat> in Europe, the practice of stocking is more conservation oriented. Um, uh, and we do not stock for ocean ranching. We stock to uphold a, a what I could try to explain is as a normal fishery where fish distribute along the river, they're not released from a big hatchery, for instance. And, uh, and the, the, so, <clears throat> so, but I think there is a big move uh, now, uh, but there is also a lot of controversy surrounding this, especially in the southern parts in Europe. There is a lot of people 
anglers, uh, stakeholders asking for to get the hatcheries back because the hatcheries was closed and replaced with habitat uh, habitat restoration. Uh, but it doesn't seem the salmon respond. And then many ask for hatcheries to come back because many people think that hatcheries work better. And I think this is a challenge that sci scientists and managers in federal ag agencies need to address better. Well, with that, we are out of time, but we'd like to give a warm welcome and say thank you so much for your time in the presentation. Um, very intriguing. And if anyone has any questions, please follow up in the chat to keep the conversation going. Um, otherwise, a quick job announcement before we let everyone go here. Um, Jerry Vasky and Mike Manfredo um, from Colorado State University started the Human Dimensions of Wildlife Journal. Um, we'd like to thank Jerry for his service as journal's editor. Uh, now, new associate editors are wanted for the journal, Human Dimensions of Wildlife. Interested individuals may contact Anita Morcio uh, directly at anita.morcio at yukon.edu or contact the three other co editors listed on the journal website. So, with that, thank you so much and uh, have a good Saturday at the conference. Cheers.